You all bear with me. Uh, I started looking at the quarterly, and it's broke down and laying the groundwork, and in the second part's the proclamation of good news. Mm -hmm. Toby opened the lesson up, did a good job with it, and then I looked at my lesson. My lesson's not a uh, shouting message. Bless you, buddy. And in the middle of social contention, it's not a popular message right now. These scriptures have found their way to be uh, uh, sensitive to this day and time in this culture. It's not my word. That's right. It's not my opinion. No, but say um, the Lord. I'm going to stand on the word today. That's right. Amen. We're not, the world's burning down before us. This book will still stand. That's right. Bless you. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, <laughs> powerful than any two edged sword, or sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of our thoughts. Oh, yeah. That's right. Romans is one of my favorite books, uh -huh. but this isn't a favorite uh, lesson I have to teach right now, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. Like Toby said last week, Romans has been considered like the Magna Carta or the Royal Charter of the Bible, the Constitution of Christianity. I would say if I was stranded somewhere and I only had one book, this would probably be my go-to. In my worst times over the past year, I have relied on this book. And it's got me through. Paul authored a, re a precise letter to the Roman church that covered doctrine, followed by duty, theology, followed by practice, understanding, followed by application, and believing followed by duty. Yeah. Its focal point is on the righteousness of God. How God revealed his righteousness to us, yeah. and it teaches us how we should respond to God's righteousness. But in this lesson, we learn about something that's not real popular. We learn about the wrath of God, yeah. the judgment of God. So before Paul can get around, as Richard was talking about good news a while ago, before Paul can get around to the good news, he lays the foundation for the bad news. Mm -hmm. yeah, you ever had somebody come up to you kind of like Richard just did, and I've got good news? It's typically based on the fact that bad news has just occurred, and it's on the cusp of this. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Amen. But good news, or bad news, is what makes good makes good news is even better. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you to look at this when you listen to this lesson, listen to it from a couple different perspectives. As a personal perspective, as a community, as the church, and our nation. Because if we, our community, our families, our country, responds and demonstrates God's righteousness, his blessing will remain upon us. Amen. The Bible says so. Now I want to ask a question. You don't have to answer. What's the worst thing God could do to us or this country? The answer is nothing. He takes his hand off of us. The worst thing that could happen. Yes, sir. Paul reveals that when God takes his hand off of us, his worst judgments are not far behind us. It's just... I think about what our first president said. This is not a political message. I won't make one out of it. George Washington said when he took office, the propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and the right that heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if America followed the ways of God, God's blessings would be upon us. Amen. If we departed, right. we'll lose it. Just like any other country. Where are we at today? This way of thinking from our first president supported by the word of God. But unfortunately, I think we're going the opposite direction right now. 
We'll start at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So number one, the wrath of God is revealed against sin. It was in the days of old. It currently is now. It always will be. The wrath of God is not a favorite subject like the love of God. We usually hear much more about the love of God. And nobody wants to teach this lesson a whole lot. Nobody wants to preach it a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But the love of God is never more powerfully received than it is after the wrath of God is revealed. Yeah. It makes it a lot better. Paul goes into a lot of detail about the wrath of God. And of course, with good reason. On down in verse 20, Paul sums it up by saying, So they are without excuse. Yeah. Well, the one thing that God will not accept for sin is an excuse. He'll accept a confession, but he won't accept a, an excuse. Yeah. So before Paul presents the gospel to everyone, he first shows that everybody stands in need of the gospel without excuse. Paul presents three different reasons why no person is without sin, why no person has an excuse for not honoring God in their life. Right. First thing he does, he, he demonstrates self-determination. He then demonstrates wicked self-deception. And lastly, he demonstrates self-destruction. I've been on most of those courses. That's good. And I teach this before I go any farther saying I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Amen. I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it again. There's no more person in here or on here in this church than what I've come through the door nine years ago. And I'll get that out. God's existence, his power, and his authority are clearly revealed. But we still sometimes are determined to go our own way. There are two things that we have to ignore when we do things our own way and we go our own way. God gave us an inner witness. Yeah. Everybody has it. Amen. Spirit. That and the conscience. Mm -hmm. That conscience governs without you knowing anything. Before you ever met God, you have an inner witness called the conscience right. that governs right or wrong. Even as a little kid, you start learning right. that's right and that's wrong, even today. I do something that I know is not right, it, it burns me right here. There's static in my heart. We all have it. Mm -hmm. God himself, the second witness, is the creation. Yeah. He's the creator of the world, the heavens, the earth, and so forth. It's called our outer witness. It's creation. So those two components, we start being able to identify that there's a creator. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them. He showed it unto them. Yeah. So the witness of the truth about God, which we all have, is the conscience, which means in the scripture, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. Yeah. We all have a God-shaped vacuum in our heart, whether you want to accept it or not. I read in a... I read in a commentary that they have polygraphed several different atheists who said they didn't believe in God and every one of them felt because deep down mm -hmm. there's a vacuum there where God is. Mm -hmm. Or would you believe? Mm -hmm. The evidence of God's presence is everywhere. Yeah. Then there's a revelation of God's truth. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, but being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Everything's made by a creator. This building, this church was made by construction workers. I thought of Kara Little the paintings that she just did a portrait for me. Yeah. She was a creator of it. She was the artist. Mm -hmm. Buildings have architects, but this earth has a better architect. Mm -hmm. 
Science wants people to believe that this whole thing started with a couple of dirt balls. Hey. Now, if you want to believe that, tell me where the dirt came from. <laughs> yeah. I don't need a PhD to figure that one out. The psalmist says the heavens declare the glory of, the, of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Mm -hmm. yes. Then we have the reach of God's truth. There's overwhelming evidence to all parts of creation. The creation and the creator show you there's a God. I wish I could bring it here and everybody have a chance to read it. It's a commentary by John Phillips on the book Gospel of John. And he goes in, he goes into some detail about DNA. He goes into some detail about the galaxy, how the earth turns. It's going three different directions at one time, or three different ways at one time. It's fascinating to learn that and to read it. I know that I, I mean it's just God flung the stars. He hung the moon. There's, mm -hmm. I, I believe that yeah. with all my heart. Yeah. The evidence of God's creative presence is found in the smallest and the largest parts of the universe. Now comes the resistance of God's truth. Although we have revelation and reach of God's truth, we have resistance. God's truth and presence. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hold means to hold down or suppress. So if someone denies the truth, he's willing to believe something different. Yeah. If you'll deceive yourself, in, you'll, you can do it. I, in my earlier days, hey, a couple of us boys get together and do something and say, man, we shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. If we're asked, here's what we say. You can just about convince yourself oh, yeah. of a lie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done it. <laughs> Almost. But there's still that conscience earlier that, or later that gets you. Paul gives three reasons why someone would do that. Some of it's related to pride and ego. A simple person we all are, we're all sinners saved by grace. Amen. Or a person who enjoys sin would rather believe a lie of his own than the truth of God's yeah. making. Yeah. Verse 21 reveals self-indulgence. <clears throat> because of that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So when you deny the truth, mm -hmm. you ultimately plummet to darkness. Every time a little bit of light is extinguished, it gets darker. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people deny God's existence. They do that to carry out their own personal agenda. Right. You start being able to justify yourself. I've been there. Oh, yeah. yeah. You start sinning, you start blaming. Mm -hmm. I do this. And, and I don't want to go into a whole lot of I, I know psychology, psychiatrists, that's a good profession. They help a lot of people, but uh, we as the state police, if uh, we're involved in a uh, critical incident, we're put on administrative leave and we have to go see one. I've had to do that. Well, I'll sit and listen to her. She was very pleasant, very nice. Uh, but the questions she asked and some of the stuff that she see, she suggested, I thought, man, that's, and I, I just kind of cut her off. And I said, I, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I'm a firm believer in the Bible and the Word of God, and, and I'm okay. And I just cut it off with that because I could see where it was going. But I thought <clears throat> she asked, uh, she was pleasant with that. She ultimately says, is there anything else you want to talk about? And I thought, man, if I sat down and talked to you about everything's on my mind, you'd be on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, uh, wasn't possible. <laughs> Verse 21 reveals self-indifference. Because of that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So when you deny the truth, I didn't read that one. Verse 22. Verse 22 tells us about sophisticated ignorance. Yeah. For 
professing themselves to be wise, they became they fools. Fool. Mm-hmm. You ever met someone that thinks they're too intelligent to believe your way? Mm-hmm. It happens all the time anymore. Yeah. They tell us that this book is written by primitive people. It's outdated. If you Google it, I think we're, that book's still the best-selling book of the world. Yeah. Next, we have idolatry. And, it, and, and it's even greater. Mm-hmm. People's got it on their phone. Yeah, it's advanced. Verse 23, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God and to an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. If man refuses to worship God, he'll eventually end up worshiping something else. Worshiping something else. <clears throat> In this day and time, idolatry range is widening daily. Uh-huh. Well, Here man stops worshiping the incorruptible God and he begins to worship the creeping things or man-made images. Yeah. I read where long ago Egyptians used to worship uh, what they called sacred beetles. I think the India still currently they worship cows. And they're on the verge of starvation sometimes. <laughs> I heard the uh, Egyptians worship cats and the cats never forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say not. <laughs> Even without that, man can still worship another form of idolatry just as bad. Yeah. Yeah. When he worships self image. Oh, yeah. Himself, his job, his yeah. lust, whatever you put before God. Whatever you put before God. Yeah. He justifies these acts and he makes them legitimate. Man exchanges the truth for a lie and begins to worship the creation instead of the creator. What's the direct result of idolatry? And we'll give you a passage of scripture in reference to this country. I believe God had a hedge about this country several years ago. They started being removed. In 1962, God was removed from our American public schools based on the argument of separation of church and state. You notice the Ten Commandments have been removed from the courthouses. You got more as the days go on, more people that's unsettled that comes out on this book and on what we believe. I do believe that it's up to, I know, and we've said it in here, it's up to parents to school their kids on Jesus. Right. But there's godless parents right now mm-hmm. that those kids don't have access to that. And they have once heard that in school. That's what I always think about. But in Psalms 106, similar things happened to Israel. In verse 34 of 106, God told his people to destroy the idolatrous nations around them that would lead them astray. In verse 35, God's people, instead of destroying them, they began to hang around them. They began to act like them. They began to know their works. They begin to worship pagan idols. In verse 37, they begin to sacrifice their own children, their sons and daughters of Israel. They sacrifice their own children on the altars. Fast forward today, the cliche is my body, my choice. But in verse 40, God kindled his wrath against them. They went too far. Verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. How does God give one up to a reprobate mind or give one over? It's after he gives adequate revelation gives you ample time to learn about him to serve him. And when you know about him, and you know about him, and he's knocked on your door countless times, he don't have to do that. He has to give you one chance. He doesn't have to give you any chance, but he does. 
but it, with me, fortunately, there was chance after chance yeah. after chance. Yeah, man. That's why I did it. But if you keep refusing that, who's to say God won't turn his back on you? You know, Andy, God, I don't mean to interrupt Go ahead. God has revealed himself, just like your lesson saying, from, from the foundation of the earth, through creation, through everything you can look at, God is in it. You know, something had to do that. It wasn't just, you know, right. it just didn't happen. And he said... He created everything, and just like the excellent point you put in, where your conscience and your heart, your vacancy in your heart, <laughs> he showed and showed and showed himself and proved and proved and proved himself. And in Acts, I think 17, 29, or 30, he said he once winked at the mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. but he don't wink no more. Because right. he's done proved himself, and he's not going to, you know, he's not gonna, you're not going to stand before judgment and say, I didn't know God. Come on, Brian. I didn't understand. I, I just, I didn't know. Right, right. That won't be no excuse. Yeah. God has revealed himself to you. He's made himself available for you. He's standing at your heart's door knocking. He said, I once winked at ignorance, but I won't wink no more. Amen. And you know, and on that day, when we're all gathered around, I can guarantee you, there'll not be one atheist. Mm -hmm. right. And they'll be saying, oh Lord, oh God. Mm -hmm. And what's he say? Mm -hmm. I know you're not. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. Well, God gave them over. That implies he withdrew his protecting hand from allowing them. And he allowed the consequences of sin to take over in their life. Verse 27. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemingly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error toward the meat. So following the consequences of idolatry, what Paul referring to here? Sodomy and homosexuality. Is it a sin? Absolutely. But I'm going to say this. Did we tell homosexuals not to come to the church? No. Absolutely not. Right. We ought to be praying for a whole congregation. Yeah, much easier. They need to hear the word. I'm not looking down on them. No. I pray to keep my thoughts, personal opinions out, and I'm the one to. The scripture is... Uh, it's pretty point blank. Yeah. But we are not. It's not up to us to judge. judge. Nope. They're welcome here. That's right. Bless you. Paul says it's unclean, lustful, dishonorable, vile, and it's a sin against nature. It's a sin against your own body. It's a sin against God, first and foremost. And if you think about it, it's a sin against the country. And I'll tell you why that in a minute. The Bible gives no scripture, none whatsoever, to justify it. For us to justify it would make God out to be a liar. Scripture just said it a while ago. Most all practices of those are acceptable now in our modern day. The Bible speaks clearly. In the days of Lot, homosexuality was a common practice. When the angels came to save them, they wanted to know Lot, or they wanted to know the angels. And as a result of sexual perversion, God turned Sodom into a heap of ashes. Yeah. It was destroyed. Peter confirms it even in 2 Peter 2 and 6. Again in Isaiah 3, 8 through 9 says that Jerusalem and Judah were ruined because their sin was that of Sodom. History repeats itself. They were carried into captivity. Moving on to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, 
God gave them over to a reprobate mind yeah. to do those things which are not convenient. A reprobate mind, you could say, is a depraved mind or a godless mind. Yeah. When it is inevitable the things, it's inevitable the things which are not proper. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and whispers. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. Amen. We're not just covering the sin of homosexuality, we're covering a multitude of sin. Right. Don't think this is a one-way road here. Mm -hmm. Without understanding covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them also. So this is spiritual perversion. You simply know God will <clears throat> that God will judge you. You know that the sin's worthy of death, yeah. but you do them anyway. And not only do you do them anyway, you enjoy the other people that want to do them. Three times in this lesson, Paul gives God's response to those that turn away. Verse 24, he gave them up. Verse 26, he gave them up. Verse 28, he gave them over. We're living in turbulent times right now. I, for the past almost 23 years, I'm, most of you know my profession in here, I feel like I work in the world. I have seen a moral decline that has been drastic, especially over the past five years. I've never seen anything like it. I leave the office half the time anymore or from call whatever I'm doing and my mind is numb on my drive home sometimes I feel like it sucks the life out of me or it, it's, it's bad and it it seems like what was yes what was always wrong is right and what's right is wrong you can't if I asked you right now and I know some of you want to think something different what the biggest sin is right now, calling sin a sin, you can't do it anymore out in public. They have created excuses for anything that you want right. to do. That's right. Mm -hmm. So again, the worst thing God can do to us is take his hand off of us. Mm -hmm. I knew I have dreaded this for two weeks. not one I wanted to teach. Bless you, buddy. Who am I? Yeah. Who am I? I've got the bad news out of the way. <laughs> I prayed for several days. God give me an ending to this that I could rehabilitate through you. Yeah. Service. Bless him, Lord. Last night. Bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. <laughs> Last night about 9.30. I went back to the book of Joshua. <laughs> second chapter. There's a woman in there that's often referred to in the Bible as Rahab the harlot. Mm -hmm. She was vile. She was a sinner. Mm -hmm. Not only was she a sinner, she practiced sin. Mm -hmm. Her profession was sin. Yeah. Rahab the harlot. Modern day time, she would be Rahab the prostitute. Yeah. She made her this. But one day, she's in her house of sin. She's probably minding her own business. She's probably thinking about what trick she's going to have to turn next to pay the bill. Get food. She can't feel good about herself. She's thinking I'm in a no-end situation. Oh, my bless you. Somebody knocked on her door. Yeah, man. Praise the Lord. She opened it up. Bless you. She realized that these men, two men were the men of God sent from 
Joshua mm -hmm. to just a modern day time of Jesus or no name of Jesus. Yeah, for sure. They began to tell her about this devastation that was coming their way. They began to tell her that what was going to happen mm -hmm. to Jericho. And she says, I know who you guys are. I know what your God did for you. Mm -hmm. I know how you got across the river. Yeah, come on. And I know that when you was at the Red Sea, I've seen it. when you had nowhere to go, and your back was against the wall, God made a way for you. Mm -hmm. there you yeah. go. And I know that that same way that God made for you, that got you through the ocean, Amen. destroyed Amen. the enemy. Amen. She said, will you save me from this devastation? Come on. They said, we will. And at that time, Rahab had a burden on her for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on, Andy. <laughs> she said, Boy, no one save me. Save my house. Yeah. Save my dad. Yeah. My mom. Yeah, my house. Save my brothers and sisters. Amen. Here's where it gets good. They said, we will. They said, hang that scarlet cord mm -hmm. out yeah. the window that you let us down by. Oh, yeah. I found it's this out blood. some time ago. You know how they tame scarlet to die at the time. There was this living creature that attached itself to a tree that they would smash and they had obtained that moisture from it, that liquid from it to be able to make scarlet. So I think at that time Rahab went to her daddy and said Dad there's destruction coming. Come on Andy. Andy. Yeah. Yeah. This city's going to burn to the ground. There's going to be people die, but I've got another way. I've got another way. I think she went to her mom and said, Mom, you carried me in your womb. Yeah. Come on. You gave birth to me, and you fed me, you clothed me, and you loved me. Mom, I can't stand the thoughts. Oh, listen, 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 listen. Of seeing you getting going to hell and dying. But I've He's got good news. Yeah. Yeah. I've got another way. Yeah. She went to her brothers and sisters. Yeah. Told them about all this devastation yeah. and said, I've got another way. Yeah. Because of this God, living man. creature. This, this living creature that died on a tree. <laughs> and I think when that day approached, they were all standing behind the line of that scarlet cord yeah. in that house, told them not to leave. I think they heard the destruction coming. I think they heard the chariots, yep. the horses, the trumpets blasting. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. They heard it all, but they were saved. That's right. And you know the best part of the whole story? <laughs> yes. Come on. Come on. Man. That prostitute, that harlot. Yes. That very same vile, wicked prostitute. Mm -hmm. Is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 The great, great day, mother of David. What a picture of grace. That's my lesson. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you.